collect from the bulletin. Let's pray together. Almighty God, without you, we are not able to please you. Mercifully grant that the Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Scripture reading is led by uh, Sister Eileen. Today's scripture passage is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 6 to 19. Let us read together. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe He is the Son of God. We believe He died and rose again. We believe that He paid for us all. And right now, we believe that He is in our midst with the power to heal our souls because of His grace, the grace to forgive all who comes to Him with the confession of sin. So Lord, as we come before you as a community here in St. John's Chapel, we want to hear from our Lord Jesus Christ who has the words of eternal life. So bless our hearing that our love, our faith in you will continue to grow according to your riches in glory. In your most precious name we pray. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, peace be with you. Uh, this time round, I'm not praying from the lectionary, which usually is the custom. Uh, I've been tasked, all right, tasked, 
to, to, to preach on Ephesians chapter 3 because we are right now in this whole series in the book of Ephesians. Uh, it's about the glory of God. And indeed, it is rightful to, to say that, uh, that we are saved for the glory of God. You know, so many at times we hear when the gospel is being preached, you know, we always tell people, you know, save, you know, so that you will go to heaven. Actually, heaven actually is by default. It's by default when we, when we receive Jesus Christ and begin to live a life that he has called us to be worthy of the gospel. Definitely, we are on the way to heaven. Yeah, so there is a process. It's not just believing in Jesus Okay, I'll just wait to enter into heaven when I die. But the moment we believe in Jesus, we become a new creation in Christ, which is so rightfully mentioned uh, by Brother Boon Singh. In fact, that was mentioned uh, yesterday in, in the preaching in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we are a new creation in Christ. You know, in the beginning, God is going to create us, fashion us, so that when we live a life, when we seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, we begin to glorify Him. And people will see the glory of God in our lives. That's the reason why Jesus said, you are the light of the world. So what light are we shining? It's the light of the transformed life. Because Jesus is the light. In John chapter 1, He's the light of the world. He came to this world that is full of darkness. So that's the reason why Jesus Christ came. He came also to glorify God the Father, to accomplish His purpose, which was a mystery. We have read in chapter 3. It was a mystery. No, actually, in fact, it's not a mystery, but somehow it's a mystery because lack of knowledge, lack of understanding. You know? And I, I, I trust that all of us has done jigsaw puzzle. You know, jigsaw puzzle. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, usually, when you do jigsaw puzzle, you, you, we have the full picture there. That's why we, 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 we uh, put all the pieces together, right? But sometimes it's more challenging is not to look at the full picture and try to, 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 to put all the pieces together. But when it's a mystery, right? We do not know the picture. We do not know the full picture. But the moment we begin to put each puzzle together, then it's no longer a mystery. And also some of us who have also uh, connect the dots uh, to have the full picture, you know. I, I do not know whether today young people or children still connecting the dots or not. One to two, two to three, you know. <laughs> when we see all the dots, we don't get the picture. But the moment we start to connect the dots, begin to see the picture. It's the same. When we read scripture, you know, we have verses here, verses there, you know. And sometimes we can't place the big picture, but as long we continue on reading again and again and again, we begin to connect the dots. And the moment we connect the dots, we begin to see it's not about us. It is about God. So Gospel Sunday is coming, 31st of July. Why do we invite the people? I hope we will start to invite them. Yeah. Why do we invite them? I hope that the, the purpose of inviting them so that the glory of Christ will dwell in their lives and they will shine for God. And when they shine for God, God will get the glory. So that's the reason why Jesus said, you are the light of the world. No? Let your good work so shine before men that others will give praise to the Father in heaven. Yeah, so it's not about going to heaven. Heaven actually is, is as I said, by default, no, actually is secondary. But the moment we glorify God in our lives, in all that we do, when we glorify living a righteous life, living a life that He has called us to live, it will make, we have more people to share the gospel. Because that will be the next generation. You know, the church grow by evangelism. The, the church grow by evangelism. So the, the, the next generation will carry the, the mission to spread 
the glory of God. So I hope this coming uh, Gospel Sunday, of course those of you who see the picture, it's a sunrise, right? <laughs> yeah, the light has come, the light has shined. The glory of God has risen. And we want to see the glory of God of those we are inviting, who have not called upon the name of the Lord. So what is that mystery? Right? What is that mystery uh, that, that has uh, been mentioned uh, in the book of uh, Ephesians? And of course, uh, in chapter 1, we have dealt with redemption. Why Christ redeem us? Right? He redeemed each one of us so that we, became, we become a body where all of us from diverse backgrounds, from, from different circumstances, you know, all of us of the past that we have, you know, is all wiped clean. It's a clean slate in Jesus Christ. That we all come together and God is building a community. A community that is reconciled to each other and also a community that is reconciled to Him. So that's the reason why we, 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 we want to have Christian gatherings, Christian fellowship. That's the reason why we make every effort to come for our worship service, not missing a service every week. Why? Because we want to gather as a community to glorify God. We want to glorify God in our songs, to adore Him of who He is, to praise Him for what He has done. We want to grow in the likeness of Christ by the hearing of the Word, because it's the words of eternal life, so that the more we hear, the more we will become. That's the reason why we come every week. It's not for ourselves. Yes, it's for ourselves, but to look beyond ourselves as a community. We are God's chosen community, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God, for He has called us out of darkness into His marvelous light, so that we may declare the excellencies of Him. The excellencies. So what are the excellencies of God? The excellencies of God is His grace, it is mercy, it is forgiveness, it is His compassion, it is loving kindness. That is His excellencies. That is His glory. So when Moses said to God, God, I want to see your glory, no, I don't know what he's, he's expecting. Maybe he's expecting to see a bright light, no, wow, no, so glorious, no, a vision. But God did not show him his face. Because God said, no one see his face and leave. Of course, God showed his physical back. But not only that physical back, it is something that God mentioned as he passed by Moses. What is His glory? His glory is the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, steadfast to a thousand generations, forgiving transgression, iniquity, sin. That's what God says. That was His glory. That is His glory. His person. The glory of God is not that shining light. The glory of God is that His personhood that shines. That shines that we be, when we look at Jesus, when one of the disciples said, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus said, You have seen me, we have seen the Father. So how did Jesus live out that life? He lived, indeed, He lived a life full of grace and compassion. Reaching out to the marginalized, reaching out to the oppressed. 
eating with the tax collectors, with the drunkards, speaking to adulterous women, engaging in conversation with prostitutes, telling the Samaritan woman, God is seeking those who are worshipped him in spirit and in truth. So Jesus is seeking, the Father is seeking for those who worship in spirit and truth. He's not seeking for people who go to heaven. Do you see that? That's the gospel. So I just want to unpack um, you know, the, 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 the purpose of proclaiming the gospel. What is that purpose? So I just want to highlight a few verses in Ephesians chapter uh, 3. In verse 6, it said, The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ through the gospel. I put an asterisk there. It's just to uh, cross-reference in Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 16. A famous statement by, by, by Paul. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation for everyone who believes, first to the Jews and then the Gentiles. The Jews, descendants of Abraham, they were chosen for a purpose, for the glory of God. For the glory of God. And this was realized in the reign of King Solomon. The glory of God shines the surrounding nations, you know, especially the building of the temple. The building of the temple. But before the building of the temple, there was a mobile temple. It's called the tabernacle, where the glory of God dwells, where they will see the glory of God through the sacrifice of animals. Because through the sacrifice of animals, there is forgiveness of sin. It shows the compassion of God. To show who He is, as was I, was, I, I mentioned earlier on, on Moses, that was in Exodus 34. So every time when people go to the tabernacle, they will remember the Lord, the Lord, God of mercy and grace. Abounding. in steadfastness and faithfulness, slow to anger. No, God, God is always quick to forgive. So that's the reason why the tabernacle is in the center of where they always dwell, so that people can have access. They will not be lost. They will know where to go because it is the center of where they dwell when they pitch their tents. That is the glory of God. So every time when the tabernacle moves, the ark moves, they will see the glory of God fire by night. And by day, they see the clouds. No fire by night, they travel by night, they need the light. As long as they follow the light, they will not get lost in the darkness. And in the wilderness, when it's day, it is hot. But that cloud covers them, protect them so that they can journey with Him. So that is the grace of God. He has given us the light, the cloud. That is His grace so that we can journey with Him. He has provided all that is necessary to follow Him. So that, going back to King Solomon, you know, King Solomon uh, shows the glory of God uh, in, in, in that temple, all right, and also that, that 40 years of peace that he, he, he rules. And the glory of God shines in such a way that the surrounding nations come and see the glory of God. And one of them is Queen of Sheba. Not in the invitation of uh, King Solomon. Uh. <laughs> Usually, we, we, our politicians right, invite you to come and visit us, right? Because Queen of Sheba, she has heard so much about Israel, this nation that worship this God. 
and hear so much good things that she wants to see for herself. So when she arrived, she said, what she has said, what she has seen is not even half that she has heard. That is the glory of God in a visible way. But somehow the Jews lose focus, they were distracted so much of themselves that they kept to themselves. And that's the reason why Paul is reminding the Jews in Ephesus, remember Jesus Christ, though he was a Jew, but remember the responsibility of the Jew to the world. The first Hebrew, Abraham, what was God's promise to him? That through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's the reason why when we read just now, Paul said, I bow my knees to the Father whose name is found in every family in heaven and on earth. You see, so he, when he said family, heaven and earth, it reminds the Jew, the first Hebrew which God spoke, to you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So the Gentiles, everyone will partake the same promise like found in Christ. They are follow as so right now, we, the church, also like the Jews, have a responsibility to tell others that they can be fellow heirs, they can be partakers of the promise. The unlimited riches of God. There's no limitation in what God can give. And even today, in today's population, we are, right, we are reaching 8 billion 8 billion in population. And from day one, from Adam and Eve until now, every generation, God has His riches to give to those who come to Him. Verse 9, is said, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery of the, the uh, mystery hidden for ages. So we have to tell the plan Correct? We always tell, right, God has a plan for you. That's a, what this is the way we are taught, right? To share the gospel. God has a plan. So what is the plan? The plan is that for them to be conformed to the image of Christ. The plan is that we are a new creation and we are given a, mini, a ministry of reconciliation. And, and, just, and Paul further go around and say, we are ambassadors. So God has set the embassy on this earth. The embassy is the church. We are all his ambassadors. Pleading, that's the word, huh? pleading to the world to be reconciled back to God. God, their creator, which many people have lost the knowledge of God, their creator who is calling them back, back to his original plan, the plan which was found in Genesis chapter 1. And God created Adam and Eve and their subsequent generation, descendants, when they populate the whole earth, it will show forth the glory of God. And this glory is to shown to the whole universe to the whole universe. It's not on earth. To the whole universe. And this is found in verse 10. Through the church, a manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You know, Paul described there are three levels of heaven. The first heaven is the atmosphere. You know, where we have the, we have the oxygen, huh? All right, the atmosphere where you see birds flying and, and of course, uh, aircraft that will go to 50, 60,000 feet. You know? that's, the, that's the heaven. Then the second heaven is beyond the atmosphere. That is called the outer space. It's a vacuum. There's no air. And that's where the galaxies and the universe are. Then the third heaven is the throne of God. 
is the place where God dwells with the heavenly hosts. So the church will declare what is that manifold wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God that God will become a man to die on the cross. We should blow our mind. That's why when we, sometimes we tell people that God become a man to die. They, they, they cannot get it. Even to the Jews. In 1 Corinthians it said, to the Jews, it is a stumbling block. Why is it a stumbling block? Because they always think that the Messiah, when the Messiah comes, it will be victorious. It will overthrow the sin of their lives. Who's the sin of their lives? The Roman Empire. <laughs> Not their own sins. Because the Roman Empire displayed that power, the domination, the subjugation, the oppression. They are hoping for a deliverance from their physical surroundings, not knowing that internally they need that deliverance. So to them, it's a stumbling block. So when Christ, I even mentioned, no, the, the, the Son of Man will be handed to wicked men and be killed. And on the third day, Rose, he mentioned to the disciples, the disciples didn't get it. Even, even Peter, when he said, Lord, Lord, this will not happen to you. See, to the Jews, it's a stumbling block. It goes again. It's not going against scripture. It goes against what they were taught, which was false. Because in Isaiah 53, it mentioned the suffering Messiah. Nobody likes suffering. <laughs> then to the Gentiles, it is foolishness. Who are the Gentiles in those days? The Romans. Alright? They thought power is dominance. Subjugation, oppression. But when they said the glory is found on the cross, to them is foolishness. So, on first hearing, when the Jews and the Gentiles, when they hear the gospel, it may, it may seem a stumbling block and foolishness, but further search, a further search in scripture will find that it's not a stumbling block, it's not foolishness. That this wisdom of God goes beyond our human thinking. Why goes beyond human thinking? Because of sin. Sin cannot cause us to think clearly. But when God come and deliver us from sin, when the renewal of our mind, when there's a renewal of our mind, we begin to see the plan of God, the will of God, which is good and perfect. That's found in Romans chapter 12. That's why we are called to, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. The renewal of our mind. Then we are able to see the purpose, the plan of God, which is good and perfect. So, the glory of God is not to be declared here on earth, but also up to the heavenly places. And indeed, it was heavenly places, right? When we look at Revelation, where every nation, every tribe, every people group, when they said, when they declare, when they proclaim, salvation belongs to our God and to the Lamb who sits on the throne. Where was this mentioned? When was this proclaimed, declared? It is not on earth. He was in heaven. So they will see the glory of God. What is the glory? Steadfastness, faithfulness, slow to anger, merciful, gracious, showing steadfastness to a thousands of generations. That is the God. And I hope by that kind of hearing, it will amaze us. And if it amazes us, then it will be our privilege in partaking of the gospel. When we understand what is the gospel is all about, then we will give ourselves, we will find it as a privilege. And Paul, 
found it as a privilege. In verse 1, he said, For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of Gentiles. Paul is willing to become all things just to bring the gospel to the Gentiles because he was the apostle to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles is more numerous than the Jews. So actually, Peter, his job is quite easy, yeah? Because the population of the Jews uh, in those days uh, is minority. So Peter was the apostle to the Jews, right? Yeah, so that's the reason why we, you don't hear much about Peter you know, traveling. But we hear Paul traveling. And his travel always encounter with dangers. He said he is danger with robbers, he is danger with fellow, uh, his fellow Jews. He, go to, he went through shipwreck. But all the challenges that he went through... Why? Because he's willing to go through because it is for the glory of God. The glory of God that will dwell in the Gentiles. And their life transformed. So when we count it as a privilege, then we have to look at our priorities, isn't it? We even have to streamline our priorities. What are our priorities that we are doing right now, what we are having right now in our life, does, what, does it count for eternity? Does it seek first the kingdom of God to declare His righteousness? And this is something that all of us have to ask God. Have to relook in our priorities in life so that we can have that privilege even Paul, he was a prisoner, not a prisoner doing wrong things. Huh? He was made a prisoner because he plead audience with Caesar. Because he has been uh, uh, accused of doing wrong, where he said, I do no wrong where, when I declare the glory of God, the grace of God, the compassion of God. It is people who are opposing him, falsely accuse him. So we can be falsely accused when we become peacemakers. You know, when Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. You know, this peacemaker, it's not, uh, we see two person quarrel, we say, hey, make peace. <laughs> Actually, all of us are peacemakers because we are extending the peace of God to people. Be at peace with God. The preaching of the gospel is the gospel of peace. That's why when we come to Ephesians 6, when that chapter is being preached, uh, put on the shoes, the gospel of peace. So when we bring the peace of God through the gospel, we are truly children of God. That's why the, after the subsequent verses, we see Jesus said, right, blessed are you those who persecute you, who malign you, who accuse you because on my account. So we're going to expect opposition challenges. But all these opposition and challenges cannot overwhelm us because the glory of God overwhelms us that we will go through all these challenges. Verse 8, Paul in his humility said that he is the very least of all the saints. You know, actually Paul is telling them, uh, if I'm the least of all the saints, uh, if this grace has been given to me, how much more all those that are above me? So this grace has been given to us to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. So when we read the gospel, what is the riches of Christ? It is not still a mystery. You know? Now we begin to see who is the Father when we see the Son. It is great love for us. It is love that is manifested, as I have to repeat it again, in His compassion, in His loving kindness, in His mercy. It is grace. That is the richness 
of Christ. And if the riches of Christ dwell in us, it will manifest in our lives. It will manifest in our lives when those who offend us. Isn't it? When someone offends us, what should we do? Retaliate or forgive? That's the reason why Christ taught us to love our enemies. Not because we have done wrong, become an enemy of those people around us, but those people who somehow make us their enemies. And we will have to continue to interact with them. That's the reason why uh, Canon Berry did mention, right, for Gospel Sunday, invite those you love and invite those you hate. <laughs> but I pray that it's not <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have resentment and, and hatefulness to someone, uh, but rather invite those who hate you. Because those who hate each one of us, when they receive Christ, there's no more hate. They will have the peace of God in their lives. Isn't it? We desire peace. We desire their good. We desire their spiritual well-being. We desire their benefit. That's the reason why, not only Gospel Sunday, eh? we don't wait every time there's a fifth uh, uh, Sunday worship service, eh? but as and when we have the opportunity, we declare the Gospel to them. So grace has been given to us for the work of God. Not grace to run the marathon, which I know uh, Standard Charter will have the marathon coming soon. Okay. Uh, not, not the grace to climb Mount, uh, Mount Everest. You know? uh, the grace will not be there. Not the grace to go through BMT. No, no. The grace that we will have to that is given to us because we'll go through challenges and opposition because we do the work of God and the will of God. And that's where grace... Isn't it when Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of time? When Jesus said, I will be with you to the end of time, that is going to be His grace. Because we are called to make disciples of all nations, teaching people to live a life of righteousness, a life that is worthy of the gospel. And that's where Jesus said, I'll be with you till the end of time. means His promise to the last generation that will see the coming of Jesus Christ. So in, in verse 13, He said, I, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering. Actually, Paul said, uh, It's my privilege to suffer for you because it is for your own good which is your glory. So in, I, I put an asterisk there, uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.14, <clears throat> Paul tells the Christians in Thessalonica, <clears throat> excuse me, Christ is your glory. Christ is your glory. So God does want each one of us to have glory, but not our own glory, but Christ's glory dwelling in us. At the third and last point, the power to progress in the gospel. <clears throat> so what is that power to progress? You know, we are called to persevere to the end. We are called to persevere to the end. And, and in Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 29, you know, God has predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son. You know, that is the end goal. You know, as we grow in the Word, as we grow in the Gospel, you know, not only just receiving the Gospel, we have to grow in the Gospel. We grow through the teachings of Christ. We grow to every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So do take note when you read the gospel, especially though the, 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 the Bible where, where there are red letters. Uh, the red letters uh, signify the, 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 the words of Jesus. You know? So take note all those 
wordings in red. Because Jesus is God, right? Every word that proceeds from his mouth. So that we can become like him. Where God will say, this is my beloved son, this is my beloved daughter, with whom I'm well pleased. Even God the Father said that to God the Son. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. When we listen to Christ, we will never go wrong. So, it is the prayer. What is the power? The power to progress. First is prayer. That's why Paul says, For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Paul has always been praying for the church. There are two kinds of prayer. If we read all his letters, a prayer of thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, is it because they, they, they score distinction for their exams? Thanksgiving, is it because they have married a good wife? No, greater than that, greater than anything, his thanksgiving is that they are growing more and more like Christ. They are growing, their faith is growing in Christ. And that is the thanksgiving. But it is still work in progress. Huh? And Paul always been, said, I've been praying for the church. I've been praying that your eyes may be open, that you will see the glory of God, that you will grow in the knowledge of Christ. So our prayer for each other, our prayer for the church, we, thanks, we, we, we thank God when we see those around us are growing in faith in Christ. We thank God in our prayers. God, I thank you at St. John's Chapel. We have seen many who are growing, but still not enough. Right? Because work is still in progress. Pray that they will continue to grow more and more. Verse 17, it says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts, in our hearts, through faith. So, how do we know Christ in our hearts? How do we know that we have faith? Faith is not a feeling. Faith, it is something that is tangible. Which Paul says that you being rooted and grounded in love. Love can be seen. It's easy to say, I love you. But most of the love that we show is always actions. What are the byproducts of love? And I have to repeat again. <laughs> the love of God is his, in His compassion, His loving kindness, His mercy, His forgiveness, His grace, His steadfastness. Those are the expression of love. We are the embodiment of God. The embodiment of Christ. So, when people say, I want to see God. So how, do, how will they see God? They must see God in the church. They don't have to see God in His physical form or His glorious form because the physical and the glorious form is found in the church. In verse 19, he said, To know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So to believe in Jesus is to fill with the fullness of God. So when we have people say, I don't want to believe in Jesus now, I, 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 I want to believe at my deathbed or at my few minutes of my last breath, uh, please correct them. Because the understanding is, I believe in Jesus just to go to heaven. Uh, since it's a passport to heaven, right now I don't believe because uh, I don't want to be shortchanged, you know, of the of the of the world, you no. Know, that can bring me joy and pleasure. But the riches of Christ is greater than the riches of this world, which God wants us to have. So it should be. So the love of God should amaze us. So in fact, we have we have songs like, 
No, every time we sing in Good Friday, how can it be that I should gain? It causes us to ask that question. How can it be because the love of God surpasses our knowledge and understanding? And later on, we're going to sing the response song. Where there's this part, and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned and unclean. I wonder how God could love me. Isn't that amazement? And I pray that, that the amazement will cause us to give our all that will have the privilege in Christ. So, in summary of Ephesians 3, I just put it in a nutshell, just to summarize, you know, that, that Paul was, all of us are given grace to suffer. It's a privilege to suffer for the benefit of others. Not for, for our wrongdoing, huh? for the benefit of others. That's sacrifice. Okay, on the behalf of those who are lost, the friends, the people around us, that whose glory, we seek the glory of Christ in their lives, that they can be fellow heirs and partakers of the promise in Christ, that, that continued discipleship, they will grow in faith. When they grow in faith, they will be filled with the fullness of God by being rooted and grounded in the knowledge of Christ's love. A new commandment I give to you, that you should love one another as I love you, by this all men shall know you are my disciples. Isn't it? So the hallmark of the glory of God in the church is the love demonstrated to the world. So Paul, and I hope all of us, will see that paying the price for others to seize that price. What's that price? The price is not heaven. Eh? The price is the glory of God in their lives. And it can, it can be attained now, here. No need to go to heaven. So I just want to uh, end with these three statements uh, after, after uh, preparing this sermon. And I hope that all that I've said can be summarized in these three, how we live our lives. The mystery of Christ revealed in amazement, because of his love, huh? our gratitude for the gospel, which is his glory, our resolute, our commitment. So I want to invite the praise team up to, to lead us in this song of response. I know we have, we have sung this uh, a few weeks ago. You know, I pray that, that, that when we sing this song again, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. I pray that we will sing it in a refreshing way. And I pray that this refreshing way will cause us to refresh, to renew our commitment in the preaching of the gospel, which is the glory of God.